Hi everyone, this video is part one of the 2B series from the Unit 2 Cognition content for AP Psychology students. If you have been keeping up with the Unit 2 series so far, you know that this unit has been separated into two parts, part A and part B, and this video is the first video in part B, which focuses on memory. And by the end, you should be able to answer these three key focus questions. Here are the vocabulary words that you should take note of while you're watching the video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So first, what is memory? Well, memory can be defined as the presence of learning over time. And this is through a process of encoding, storing, and retrieving information. And in the next few videos about memory, you will learn very specifically about those three components, encoding, storing and retrieval, and then I'll follow up with a final video about forgetting and memory challenges. But today's video lesson will focus on some of the approaches that help us better understand and explain what memory is. So first, I want to talk about memory on a biological level, specifically what's happening in the synapses. You need to know a term called long-term potentiation, or LTP, which is the process by which repeated stimulation of a neural pathway leads to an increase in the strength and efficiency of the communication between those two neurons. So LTP is uh, the fundamental element or fundamental biological mechanism that underlies learning and memory. In more simple terms, LTP means that the more you use a neural pathway, the stronger and more efficient that neural pathway becomes. And you can see this by comparing the two diagrams on the screen. The illustration shows a before and an after comparison of, a, of the same synapse. And you can see after repeated communication, a change occurs in the synapse. Notice the difference between the two synapses in the, the two side-by-side -side illustrations. After repeated signals, the receiving neuron has now increased its synaptic strength. And it, you can see on that second diagram that that particular receiving neuron now has more receptor sites that allow it to receive more neurotransmitters. So LTP is a physical change that happens in the synapse that occurs after repeated communication. And this leads to a greater likelihood that the neuron will fire when the signal is sent again. So here are two images on the screen that are from an electron microscope, and you can see they show a before and after series that shows before and after potentiation. And it's not quite as clear as the illustration on the previous slide, but this is a real synapse, and it's showing you what happens after repeated use. So in image A, you can see the red axon terminal of the sending neuron, and then below it is the gray dendrite of the receiving neuron. And then you can see this gray ice cream cone-shaped object and it's extending up from the dendrite toward the red axon terminal and this is a receptor site. This is what is receiving the neurotransmitters that are crossing the synapse. And now then if you look at image B, you can see that after repeated use, the dendrite now has two receptor sites. And this is a physical change that has occurred in the synapse after repeated use. And this will increase its sensitivity to detecting the presence of neurotransmitter molecules released by the sending neuron. And this demonstrates the biological explanation of learning and memory at the synaptic level. And you already know that the hippocampus is responsible for long-term memory, but there are so many other aspects of memory and there are many other brain structures that are involved in the processing of information. And so here I'll give you a general overview of the different brain parts that are responsible for this information processing. First and foremost, it's important that you know that the hippocampus is responsible for creating and storing those explicit long-term memories. These are memories that you're consciously aware of, and the hippocampus is responsible for turning those short-term memories into long-term memories. Next is the amygdala. And you are familiar with the amygdala as far as its role in emotion, especially fear and anger and aggression. Well, the amygdala is also responsible for connecting emotions to memories. And this makes those emotionally significant events easier to remember, especially those fear-related ones. Next is the prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of the brain that's in charge of your working memory. And your working memory is a type of memory that I'll discuss a little bit later, but it's important in that temporary active process 
processing of information in your mind. And this is that part of your brain that is involved in planning and decision making and organizing those thoughts. The next is, uh, part of the brain is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum, as you know, is coordinating some of those motor movements. And this is involved in the memory of physical skills and motor memory. Um, the cerebellum helps you remember how to perform tasks that you know how to do, like riding a bike or typing on a keyboard. Next is the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are a group of structures and they're located near the thalamus and they're surrounded by the cerebral cortex. The basal ganglia is similar to the cerebellum in that they are also, these structures are also involved in motor memories of automatic behaviors, specifically things like um, remembering how to brush your teeth or tying your shoes. Finally, the last part of the brain where memory is processed is the temporal lobes. And the temporal lobes are what house, um, especially on the left side, Wernicke's area, which is where our understanding of language is. And this is where our memory for language is housed, as well as the fusiform gyrus. And this is the part of the brain that is responsible for recognizing objects, specifically faces. And as you learned in the previous unit, if the fusiform gyrus is damaged, then this can cause prosopagnosis which will inhibit the ability to recognize facial features. These are the different structures that are involved with this information processing that's related to memory. So now that you understand memory from the biological dimensions of the synaptic level and then the brain structural elements of memory, now let's work through memory as a cognitive process and we'll kind of work through the different levels. So memory is complex and cognitive psychologists who study memory have tried to create some models to help people better conceptualize how memory works. And this is the first model that you need to be familiar with. It's called the multi-store model. Now the multi-store model was proposed in 1968 and it describes memory as a sequence of three different stages, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. And it starts with information in your environment. And let me use watching a movie as an example. After watching a movie, days, weeks, or years later, you might remember a specific scene or you might even recall a specific line, um, but you're not necessarily going to remember it as a recording from beginning to end, uh, understanding and knowing and remembering all of the different elements exactly how they were presented. It's just not how memory works. And so the multi-store model helps explain how some of that information goes in, some of it stays momentarily, and then some of it stays longer. So let's use this example of a movie um, to explain the multi-store model. So as you're watching the movie, the lights are flashing and it's coming into your eyes and the sounds are coming out and they're going into your ears and you're picking up that information through your senses. And so your sensory memory is going to take in that information and it will hold it for a very brief period. Sensory memory is very, very, very short, typically less than a second for visual stimuli and only a few seconds for auditory stimuli. The visual information that's coming into our eyes through sensory memory is called iconic memory. And this is just the momentary memories that enter our eyes and stay only for a few tenths of a second. Now, the auditory information that comes into our ears through sensory memory is called echoic memory, and this too is really brief. Unless the sounds are meaningful enough to move it into short-term memory, those sounds are going to be lost within three to four seconds. This is why if a teacher immediately says to a student, what did I just say? The student might actually be able to rattle it off the exact sentence word for word, but if the teacher were to ask the students a few minutes later, what did I say? They probably are not going to rattle it off word for word because it went into their sensory memory that only holds those auditory uh, memories for just a few seconds. So this is your sensory memory. This storage, uh, this um, capacity is very short. If you pay attention to the information and it's meaningful to you and you hold on to it and you're processing it in your attention and your mind, it's going to move from sensory memory into short term memory. And most people use the phrase short term memory incorrectly. In psychology, short term memory is just referring to a 
temporary holding place in your mind that has limited capacity and it holds information that you pay attention to. But you can usually only hold that information for about 15 to 30 seconds. Here in short term memory, information can be rehearsed or repeated to hold on to it and extend its duration. However, if you don't continue to rehearse it or repeat it to yourself, that information will eventually fade away. So your short term memory is what allows you to remember a phone number long enough to dial it. But then after you stop rehearsing it, you'll likely lose it. Now, long term memory is a more permanent storage system. This is what can hold vast amounts of information for extended periods and its capacity can range from days to a lifetime. You can transfer information from short term memory into long term memory storage, but you have to do something with that information, which we'll learn more about in an upcoming video. But if that information um, isn't linked with something meaningful or connected to some kind of existing knowledge, you're not going to be able Able to move it into long term memory storage. Now, there are three additional terms related to the multi store model, and these are encoding storage and retrieval. And I'll define them here. But I actually will have entire videos devoted to each of these steps. Now, encoding is the word used to describe the process by which information goes into the memory system. Storage is the word we use to describe the process by which information is retained or held or kept in our memory over time. Retrieval is the word we use to describe the process of getting the memory out of storage. So this early model was called the multi store model, and it helps cognitive psychologists explain the flow of information through the different types of memory storage. While the multi store model outlines the stages of memory from sensory short term to long term memory, a later researcher named Alan Baddeley recognized that short term memory needed a little bit further explanation. He believed it was just a little bit more complex and bigger than just holding information as long as it can be rehearsed. So he coined the term working memory to better explain what is happening in this stage of information processing. And it's important to understand that Baddeley didn't think that working memory should replace short term memory, but rather it just helps us better understand what our mind is doing in those thought processes during the short term memory phase. The concept of working memory just enhances our understanding of how we're actively using and manipulating information at this particular stage. So this diagram is updated to show working memory in the middle between sensory and long term memory. So what is working memory? Working memory can be defined as a system that temporarily holds information and actively uses it for tasks like reasoning and problem solving. The Myers textbook calls it the conscious active processing of sensory information, along with the processing of information retrieved from long term memory. Think of it like this. Suppose I give you a math problem to solve in your head. Hold this math equation in your mind without writing it down. Three plus three plus five minus two. For this task, you are using your working memory. You are taking in the sensory information you heard, holding it and processing it while also taking information out from your long term memory about addition and subtraction. Did you do the math problem three plus three plus five minus two? If so, you used your working memory and you got the number nine, right? Great job. So Alan Baddeley identified three key components of working memory. He called it the central executive, the phonological loop and the visuospatial sketch pad. The central executive acts as the control center of your working memory, and it is deciding what to do with that information and managing the task. It's coordinating the activities of your phonological loop and your visuospatial sketch pad. The phonological loop is the part of your working memory that's processing the sound. The phonological loop is holding that auditory information briefly in your mind, allowing you to repeat it over and over in your mind. For instance, if you were working through that math problem in your mind, you were likely repeating three plus three plus five minus two using your phonological loop.
the visuospatial sketchpad handles the spatial information in your working memory. This is the part of your working memory that helps you create mental images and understand spatial relationships. For example, if I were to ask you to think about how you could resize or rearrange the shapes on this diagram on the screen to better fit the space on the page, in your mind, you would be holding and manipulating that visual information in your mind. This visual representation of working memory comes from the University of Utah's Genetic Science Learning Center's website, and I like how they've positioned working memory side by side with short term memory on their website. They use this example and they explain working memory like this. Working memory helps us carry out a task, achieve a goal, or solve a problem. And it's like a temporary mental workspace where we can bring together information from short-term and long-term memory and then do something with it. For example, to do mental math, we use multiplication rules that we've stored in long-term memory to work on numbers stored in our short-term memory. Complex tasks like driving a car or reading also rely on working memory. We're using skills and rules we've stored in our long-term memory, but we also take in and react to new information as we experience it. So working memory also helps us control our attention and what we experience through our concentration. So to close out today's video, let's do a few short questions for review. I will read the questions aloud, but not the answers. So be sure to pause the video if you need a little extra time to process each of the response options. This is the first question. In history class, James is effortfully and actively thinking about how various events connect with one another, connecting the new material to what he has learned in the past, making connections in the moment best describes James. Question number two says, while reading about the results of a study on memory, imagine that you read this statement. After observing hundreds of participants across their lives, researchers found that this type of memory is nearly limitless and lasts at times for a lifetime. Which variable is most likely being discussed in this description? Question number three says, which of the following best describes long-term potentiation? This concludes today's video lesson on an introduction to memory.